Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. Joining us today is Jason Hamlet. Now, Jason is the host of I Hunt Podcast. And the special thing about Jason is he just started hunting about five years ago and got a crew together and they just spin stories and listen to stories and talk about tips and techniques and what it takes to put mature whitetail on the ground. When I asked Jason about his one big thing, he said patience. And he, that has changed over the last five years. Patience, number one, in this first year was um, just get out there and, and, and sit in the stand all day. Like a lot of you, I've done that. And uh, if it's the wrong stand on the wrong day, you have a nice all-day sit. And so Jason has uh, tuned up his game, and he's, he's taken some nice bucks there in southwest Ohio. So I'm really looking forward to him to share some of his Big Buck Tips on Whitetail Rendezvous. Hey, folks, we're heading out to <laughs> Southwest Ohio, and we're going to connect with Jason Hamlet. Jason is the host of I Hunt Podcast. If you haven't listened to it, you ought to check him out because he's got some great stories there. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Bruce. It's an honor to be on the show. I've been uh, I've been listening to you for for quite some time, so it's it truly is an honor to be able to sit and chat with you tonight. Well, it, it, it's all about having fun, and, and folks in the warm up, we were talking a little bit of shop, not too much, but it's just so interesting um, how both of us get into the podcast business, and we're going to jump right in right there and have Jason give us some uh, backstory on why I Hunt Podcast began. Okay, the I Hunt podcast it kind of it it kind of evolved to where you know I first started hunting, and when I had my uh, my first successful harvest after a couple of seasons, it was like I had that moment in my head where I was like, man, it would have been great to be able to share this journey with people and share uh, share the the story that I went through, you know, practicing to use a bow and learning the taking the steps to learn different avenues in the woods, you know, on by yourself learning these things by yourself. And I think it would have been good to kind of document that and share that with people to encourage other hunters who maybe think about taking up the sport that it, it is possible to pick up at a later age in your life. And um, I didn't do anything with it at that time. And then the, the following year, I harvested a buck and it was my first buck ever. And I thought to myself, the exact same thing. I was like, man, this would have been a second, a great second chapter of this story. And uh, why am I not getting off my butt and sharing these adventures and sharing these stories with people? And, uh, so that's kind of a few months after that, I started the I Hunt podcast, and it's about exactly what it sounds like. It's about, you know, my hunting experiences and uh, friends who I've met along the way's hunting experiences and and just the guests that I have on the show, their hunting stories, and they're, it's just about sharing experiences and learning from that. If you would, share us a couple of different episodes of, you know, some of the funny things that you've heard from other people since you started your podcast. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, just a funny story. I had a uh, fellow by the name of Steve Miller on who uh, he was really big into bird dog. And that's been the great thing about this show is I'm able to talk to people that's into so many different things than I'm into. You know, I right now I'm just mainly turkey and deer. But, uh, you know, he's a bird dogger. And uh, is to hear how they train the dogs and just it's a totally different than what I thought it was. And then uh, to come to find out he's actually trained a goat to chase rabbits, if you believe that or not. <laughs> uh, I'm not cert too certain about that. I haven't seen uh, a goat chasing uh, <laughs> rabbit. I guess rabbit goat, but um, it works for me because um, you know it's unbelievable what's out there. That's for that's for sure. Yeah, he's got pictures to prove it. <laughs> and I guess probably, uh, I mean, aside from just an episode, I mean, just some of the the guys that I've had on the show who who've kind of became a more I mean, there really are a full-time part of the show now. Um, Jake Franklin, uh, Jerry Roberts, uh, Chris, the real world redneck and uh, Don Pratt. These guys have all come on and, and they're, they're sharing their stories with me as we go. And it's, it's just, it's just phenomenal. The type of community that's been built up on Twitter from this and uh, just the community that's surrounded and, and meeting these guys and sharing the stories with them is just amazing. And uh, 
I think we're going to start leaning more towards that format of us five guys uh, kind of just sitting around and sharing our hunting stories and bringing a guest on with us. We've mastered the the five person podcast over the internet, as crazy as that sounds. <laughs> now, do you use um, uh, Facebook Live or Skype or how, how do you do that? Right now, we're doing it uh, with Skype. So um, we're looking at trying to get some avenues to post up the video of some of these conversations to or have, add a little bit more content and something a little bit more special for the YouTube viewers out there. Yeah, and that's where, uh, you know, I went to Blue Jeans, um, oh, I don't know, a few months back. I was on Jalan, John Stallone's show, um, and he used Blue Jeans. I went, why? And he got it so you can record audio, video, or both. So take a look at it. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I mean, I was checking your interface. I'll definitely check it out. Uh, is it have the capabilities of doing more than two, three, four people at a time? I believe so. You know, I, I don't do that, but I'm looking at participants and it has two, you know, and I'm I'm sure you can you can uh, leverage it up, um, you know, to more than that. So, you know, just take a look at it yeah, and, for sure. and, and see if that, you know, see if that will work. Because if I, I tell people, if I can use this technology... Anybody can. <laughs> yeah, I got some pretty, uh, some pretty digitally uh, slow learners on my side over here. So, <laughs> yeah, I hear that. So let's let's change it up a little bit and and talk about how you just started hunting five years ago. What's up with that? Yeah, you know, it was something that uh, I kind of. I was never a type that would even have thought about going hunting. Uh, I'm not like I ever looked down on hunters, but I, I never really had the respect for what hunting actually meant. You know, growing up, I didn't, I grew up in a, like a fishing family, you know, we didn't really, I had no really mentor that would have showed me how to hunt. And then it just, uh, it just started blossoming to where I got turned on to uh, Steven Ranella and uh, I started watching his show and without him being a hunter and realized like, you know, I'm, I'm into this, his hunting show and, and what he stood for and the whole uh, processing the game and keeping your hands on, uh, being the only person hands on your meat from the time it's harvested all the way to the plate. And it just, uh, it really kind of struck a chord with me in this day and age. Uh, you know, it just seems like we're going into these stuff supermarkets with uh, who knows where you're getting your meat from or what it is. And it's just, it's one of the things that I I wanted to see if I could try for myself, and I kind of hinted around with the wife to it about her to her about it. And for Christmas, she got me a bow out of nowhere, and I was like, "Well, I guess now I got to learn how to hunt." <laughs> so that's where it began. Was that a recurve compound? What kind of bow was it? It was a compound bow, and uh, I took it to the local pro shop and got it all set up for me, and uh, just started practicing. And I. I actually started hunting that season in January, so I knew I didn't shoot it enough. But thank God I didn't know enough about putting myself in front of a deer. To, <laughs> so I was just really just freezing my toes off in January. So, so you decided you you watched Steve Ranella, and then you said, you know, I want to try that. But you know, typically somebody goes and, and gets a mentor, or somebody mentors them, and uh, and I know that happened in my life long, long, long time ago uh, in a galaxy far away. You know, and I started doing that. <laughs> but you think about that. Now, how did you do that by yourself? I'm very interested in that because I've got some listeners that are probably saying, you know, nobody's helping me. I'm, I'm all by myself. But it can be done. That's what I hear you telling me. Yeah. Yeah. You make a lot of mistakes. I mean, I can take you back to that first season I sat. I was sitting on the ground in the snow on the edge of a cornfield like i mean it's it's ridiculous to look back now <laughs> and realize what i was doing but i mean you have to just you have to put one foot in front of the other and and no you know what you are going to make a ton of mistakes uh but you got to keep reading every article you can get your hands on uh, i mean youtube is huge obviously you can search for anything you want to learn about on youtube and then just listening to great podcasts you know like your podcast and there's some other great uh plenty of podcasts out there who have a, uh, who can deliver a, a lot of good information. So, so, um, one, you need a bow Two, you need to get on, on the web digital world and, and, and start figuring out, okay, I'm going to hunt whitetails. I'm in the oh, Ohio, um, and this is the type of terrain and how am I going to do this? And then what about 
gearing up. I mean, because there's so many choices. Forget about broadheads and all that, but just, you know, the type of shoes and, and the camo <laughs> or the carbon fiber. I mean, how how you sort of through all that? Man, you know, I still don't sort through all that, to be honest with you, Bruce. <laughs> I mean, I uh, when I got started, you know, my bow, my wife had bought secondhand from um, somebody who was selling the bow, uh, just a friend of a friend. And then uh, a lot of my camo came. Uh, I do have a buddy from high school who we kind of reconnected when I got into hunting and uh, he had been hunting. So he has some stuff. He took me out maybe like once or twice that first year. And he had some camo that he sold me like a barrel of it for like 20 bucks that he didn't wear anymore. So I kind of had hand-me-down camo at the start and rubber boots. I, I didn't have, I just had some rubber boots. So I obviously froze my, froze my toes off that first year. But I mean, you just get, you, you get out with what you got and uh, make the mistakes now, you know? I mean, I don't think it matters when you're new, what camo you have and, it's just you got to have that experience in the woods of to realize like you hear what people say a deer can smell. But until you're out in the woods and you see it and then you start realizing, well, I got to do a better job at this or same thing with their eyesight and where you where you're placing a tree stand at. And just all those things just kind of unfold as you get in and you just that's just always been the guy I kind of guy I am. I just kind of dive into it and figure it out as I go. Now, are you hunting out of um, hang-ons or climbers or what type of um, tree stands are you using? Well, then that first season, I was just hunting on the ground. Uh, and then the following, I, well, now I've evolved to where I'm using some you know, ladder stands, cli- uh, climbing stands, and hang-on stands. This year was actually my first year that I successfully was able to go into an area and, and hang a stand and... Uh, like hang a hang on stand and hunt it that same evening and with some success. So I think that was a big, uh, as a big, uh, success for me this season so far. Yeah, that's great. Cause that is an easy, now you use steps to get up in your, your hang on. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just steps and, and hanging on by my, and you know, anytime anybody who's hung a stand up by themselves, no, it's, it's, it's difficult work, especially if it's your first time doing it. And, uh, and then to be able to pull that off and get in the stand and end up shooting. I didn't end up shooting a deer out of that night, but the next night I ended up shooting a deer out of it. So just from using the strategy of staying patient this year and not going in an over flooding area and kind of hanging on as I go. Now, um, the deer you shot this year, was that that uh, piebald uh, doe? Yes, yes. It was, uh, it was a beautiful looking uh, piebald doe. I couldn't believe it when I caught her on camera this uh, earlier this season because we went through this uh, this uh, phase in our show this year where we were doing this thing called gaining ground. And the whole point behind it is we were sharing our experiences of going out and knocking doors for more property this season, for this upcoming hunting season. And uh, this was one of the properties that I was able to land off doing that. So it, it all kind of puts the story in the twofold for the season as you go out and I knocked on some doors and got some permission. It was only a 15 acre parcel. But uh, on the trail cameras, just from running them, because I didn't have a whole lot of time to run the trail cameras, first season hunting it. And uh, I found, I've seen a few pictures of her, the piebald, and I have a few nice bucks on the property. So uh, I knew she, you don't normally put a doe on your target list, but you know that doe, if I saw her, I, she was definitely going to be a target. <laughs> so how, tell us about the hunt. Was it an afternoon hunt or, or morning hunt? It was an afternoon hunt. I actually got there uh, after work and it actually played out nice because I had hung that stand on a Friday and I didn't see anything on the Friday night. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I back up a little bit, but the uh, Saturday and Sunday, it rained all day. So I didn't get to hunt there, but I knew the Monday that I ended up hunting that it was going to rain early morning up until about 10 or 11 and then start the rain was going to stop and we had a nice cooler weather in. So I knew those deer were going to be up moving early after that rain trying to get out from them wet trees that they're under and get out in the field and dry off and get some much needed nutrition that they've probably been not moving a whole lot in the in the monsoon we were having and uh sure enough i got out there about 4 15 p.m and they, it goes back to this whole patience thing because this was the the slowest i've ever walked to my stand um Ever in my life, you know, I was like a ninja walking, just finding every piece of green grass can on the edge of this corn, this uh, plowed cornfield I was walking down and uh, took my time, got in my stand. And within 15 minutes of being in my stand, deer started showing up in front of me. And uh, she stepped 
she was the second deer that ended up coming out uh, by five o'clock. And uh, I, I've shot a few deer in my short time. But this was one of the. This was the first time that I had to actually draw on a deer when I have other deer in the field watching me. So it, it was definitely a new challenge and a new uh, something that I that is nice to get some experience with before it's that big buck I'm staring at. And well, yeah, because uh, all those eyes. I mean, it gets dicey. It really does. It it really does. I mean, you kind of got to, it's like playing a, a chess game to where you're watching each deer and making sure, okay, he's looking over there. So if when she looks this way, I know I can draw. But if he's still not looking that direction he was looking, when she looks that way, then you you kind of got to just wait and be patient and, and wait him out. And I finally got to a full draw on her. She was about 15 yards quartered away on me. And uh, I... <laughs> I've done this before and you figure I'd learn, but when I got back into full draw, my uh, trigger release on my, uh, my little trigger on my release on my bow was flipped around the opposite way than I'm used to having it. So instead of sitting off to my right, it was sitting off to the left. So uh, last time when this happened to me, I tried to just move my finger over and I actually clicked the trigger and shot an arrow 20 yards over a deer's back. So this time I ended up, <laughs> <laughs> this time I ended up releasing from full draw, clipping out, switch flipping over, clicking back in, and getting back to full draw on her. Oh my goodness! And uh, yes, yes, and I was able to uh, pull that off and uh, get the shot off. And uh, you know, uh, at this, I think I have a hard time always still at this early stage of my hunting career of of, no, of knowing how well I hit an animal. I mean, because I just haven't shot enough of them, and I. My mind always goes to maybe I didn't hit her so well. I, I don't know if that's what every deer hunter thinks, but I always think like maybe I didn't hit him hit him right because I just that's just always a fear. I don't want to injure an animal. And uh, got down and saw good blood and uh, back you know bubbles in the blood still make me feel confident. I hit some lung and then I get back out to my car, wait about forty five minutes. Uh, hindsight, I don't think I waited long enough because I go back in and start doing some tracking on her. And uh, I was actually talking to one of the the co-host on the show, Jake Franklin, because he was one of the first people I called, and he was kind of helping me on the phone with me as I was tracking her. And uh, realized I jumped a, I thought maybe I jumped something, but I thought it was a bird, you know. And it was kind of one of those things, like, well, maybe it was a bird. Then I walk up in there, twenty yards on the trail, and I see, yeah, okay, there's a big spot of blood and no deer. So I obviously jumped her up. So I backed out for probably till about dark for another hour and a half and waited even longer. And at that point. Uh, I was able to call on some reinforcements, my wife, uh, my, my father-in-law, uh, my mother-in-law. I was, God bless my wife for getting out there in the woods in the dark. It's totally outside of her element and trying to find some blood. Uh, but a long story short on this, I guess, is we ended up getting, uh, hearing some dogs running around in the woods and couldn't figure out what was going on. And my father-in-law, who was off, took a different direction from me, started calling us over. And he had said that he had just seen the, seen the deer. And she was laying down and she was still breathing and she was about 10 to 15 yards from him. And uh, the dogs came in and jumped her up. So I knew it's about nine o'clock, nine 15. I got dogs around these woods chasing this wounded deer. So it's like, I know I'm not going to find her tonight, obviously. So I back out again and uh, call off work the next morning and get out bright and early at first light by myself and pick up a day, uh, pick up a overnight trail, blood trail. It's the first time I've, ever had to even think about doing something like this and you know when you're doing that it's like you got dew from the night before so all that blood starts dissipating into the water and it's making it harder to see and it just presents a whole element of challenges especially somebody who doesn't like i said i haven't trailed a whole lot of blood trails and uh with some advice and some tips like i said from the community that we that i've developed and from uh jake again uh he got me was able to follow some of my blood trails i was plotting along on Twitter and uh, kind of pointed me in the right direction. I kind of started walking and sure enough, I was picking up blood more and more and about 9 a.m. that morning, I found her. So it was uh, 14 hours after I shot her and I was, I was truly blessed to have found her really. I, I thought I thought those dogs chased her clear across the county. So yeah, you can't control the dogs or the coyotes or the bears. I mean, you just, you just can't. So let's just go back and okay. You smoked the deer, but maybe you got her high, maybe a little far back. I don't know. Where where did you hit her? Well, she was, uh, like I said, she was quartering away, but she was quartering away pretty hard. 
and I end up hitting, uh, I end up catching his shoulder blade on her left shoulder blade. And, but I, I got good penetration. She, it went through and it went through, just clipped her left lung and it did come. I did have an exit hole, but the arrow didn't, it didn't pass all the way through. Actually, I never found my arrow. Uh, I, when I, when she was running off, she, it was still in her and I knew she wasn't using her left leg. So it was kind of like hoping I got behind the shoulder, but, but I didn't get behind the shoulder, but got enough to where I caught that lung. It's just, I think a lot had to do with the dogs pushing her, just kept her adrenaline enough and kept her alive for a lot longer than it probably should have. So let's go back. And I think you said it, you know, you, you took the shot, you waited about 45 minutes. Now it's not raining out. It's clear. I'm assuming. And um, That's right. how long are you going to wait the next time? <laughs> Similar shot. <laughs> Similar shot. I'm waiting an hour and a half next time. I'm not going to, I'm not rushing myself into the, into the woods. Unless I hear a crash or see them fall, I think I'm just going to leave a standard hour and a half because I don't want to put myself in a situation of jumping a deer again. Because if I wouldn't have jumped her that first time, then the dogs wouldn't have jumped her later. Yeah, she would have expired. When you walk back out, you would have found her right away. Right. That's, that's my thinking. And these are lessons learned, folks. And we all get excited. And, and land sakes, I've, I've made every mistake in the book. But if, you put a good shot on them. You can see them and you know, you know where your arrows hit and, and that only comes with time, Jason. That's the only way, you know, shoot enough deer and you just, you're steady. You watch your arrow and you see the point of impact and the arrow mm-hmm. pass through, you know, I shot a bear once out of a tree stand and my arrow just went right through and stuck in the dirt. So, and it, you know, <laughs> went down there. It was just solid blood. Uh, who's the guy? Uh, striker, you know, red veins outdoors. I mean, it was, it, it's just like, Oh, cause I didn't want to track that guy at all. And I heard him die. You know, I, no, I you definitely, <laughs> you know, that, but, if I was hunting a bear, I'd, I'd be waiting about six hours before I got tail, <laughs> tail. <laughs> no, but it's all the same. We all, we, you know, as ethical hunters, that's people who, you know, are conservationists and people who, you know, uh, realize the value of, of our quarry, the, the deer, you know, not just not just the food value, but uh, the value they present in our lives, and we owe them the best that we can do. And you know, and so everybody gets excited, and you know, the best thing is to back off, wait. You know, text all your buddies, your friends, and say, "Hey, got a buck down, got a doe down," and um, you know, uh, meet me at my tree stand in an hour and a half or something, and just sit there and enjoy. You know, enjoy. You know, being out there. Uh, rather than even getting down out of your stand. Uh, that, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, and that's one of those things that, you know, you, you hear people say stuff like that and tell you things like that when you're, when you're starting, but it's, it, it doesn't really, at least for me, it doesn't sink in. It doesn't sink in until, you know, I make that mistake myself. And it's like, you know, now that I've done that and I, and I was faced with that feeling when I went to bed Monday evening, it's like, I had the feeling that I just lost this deer and it was my fault. I pursued, pursued her too fast. And uh, now the steer may die for not. I may never find her. Are these dogs going to tear her up? You know, and when you when you start having those emotions and, and literally like when I'm talking to my wife about it, almost in tears because, you know, she's just such a beautiful animal being rare as she is. Not only all deer are beautiful, but I mean, a rare piebald deer. And I just it just wouldn't have done it justice if I couldn't have recovered that deer. So thank the Lord that uh, I ended up like the, the, the trail that I ended up tracking the blood trail ended up being 588 yards from where I shot her. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Thanks to dogs and a little bit of my own stupidness. <laughs> but you got community, you know, um, you just mentioned some of your guys when you're co-hosts and everything. Let's talk about how you develop your community and, and what that means to you. Man, the community that I've that we've developed around the show means means just the world to me because uh, I mean, as you know, when I got into hunting, I, I didn't have a whole lot of people around me who hunt, and I didn't grow up in the hunting culture, so I didn't have a whole lot of friends that hunt. And now that I've I've started this show, and you know, I've met the like the guys that are some of the co-hosts on the show who I mentioned earlier. I mean, they've just been so helpful and just so awesome, and and always giving me tips and. Uh, and just the community and Twitter is, is just so that we've the followers that we've been able to get are just so supportive and they're always sharing their own experiences and what they're seeing in their woods. And it's just that just means so much to you when you're sitting at work. You know, I work a nine to five too, like everybody else. When you're sitting at work and uh, you want to be outside 
and one of your followers is outside and they shoot a deer i mean you're just you're just as happy for them as you would be for yourself and it's like like today i mean literally 15 minutes before you called bruce i got a call from uh tony rose a guy who was on uh Oh, I can't remember what episode number was. I'm terrible at that. But he was on my show, and he just shot a doe from his stand. Uh, I was the second person he called, and he shot her with a flint tip arrow. Oh, he napped it, did, he, did he nap it himself? Uh, no, he had some. He had somebody uh, make them for him. But yeah, that's amazing. And and I've known a, a couple of different people. They actually get you know the flint, and then they take it deer horn and nap it and then they they you know wind it on the cedar shaft with rawhide i mean this is almost you know going back to traditional uh mm-hmm. time and um just unbelievable and and those broadheads are extremely sharp oh yeah they are i mean he was he was showing some videos of some penetration he was having on just uh when he was just shooting it for practice and it was it was really amazing how efficient those just a stone tool like that can be and uh when he like i said just just from the community aspect of it though those calls like that i didn't get a year ago you know i mean he called me like i said he was the second person i was second person he called and he's still shaking in his voice he's still shaking still in his stand and it's like i i'm shaking hearing about it and like just so excited (laughs) for him it's just uh it's just those are the types of things that it's all about, you know, to me. And that's why I love doing the show that I do is just just to have people on to share that and to, and to have them share that with me. It's just I, I don't need to make any money off of any sponsors. That, that's that's reward in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. And it's I call it common ground. Um, you know, my show's about real people in real places. And but it, we're all on common ground because you, you can you can go to an elk camp, deer camp, whatever kind of camp, any place in the country or North America. And, and we're all hunters. Mm -hmm. That's a neat thing. And you'll never know who's sitting beside it because nobody really cares. And, you know, you just talk hunting and, and it's the commonality uh, that I find intriguing, you know, with Whitetail Rendezvous, it's the commonality you have with people that all different walks of life and guys and gals. And it's unbelievable. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 unfortunate that there are these little little hangups that we have here and there along the way in the hunting community between, you know, this type of weapon over this type of weapon or this type of hunting over this type of hunting. But and, and you know, those things kind of get blown up more. And I think they happen, I think, because this community, I mean, just me being a novice hunter and getting in, I cannot tell you the amount of people who have reached out to help me and to give me advice, you know. I like I said I grew up a fisherman. When I when you fish, if somebody was catching something, they are not going to tell you what they're using, and they're not going to tell you where you're fishing at. I mean, these hunters, though, they just are willing to share everything. So I'm very fortunate to, for that community. Let's talk about uh, passing it on, uh, and that's one of the things that's near and dear to your heart. So share with our listeners what that means to you. Well, you know, that means a, a ton to me because that was also another driving factor to getting into to learning to hunt is as you start as, as a man. When you have a little boy, you start looking at the types of the the types of things you're going to be able to pass that down to him and that you know about and that and that are going to be worthwhile in his life to, to share with him. And, you know, you start looking at your own abilities and where you fought at. And I think this the I don't want to say like hunting is like going away, but it, it's definitely a it doesn't seem like it's something that i think i feel like is being brought onto the majority of the next generation as has in years past and i want my child to be able to have that connection with nature in this world of iphones and tablets and everything now 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 reward now 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 i want him to be able to have that time that he appreciates in the woods doing something that is very hard and takes a lot of discipline and a lot of time to get good at and to a lifetime to master to just to kind of have that escape from what the world's going to look like here in the next 15, 20 years. So if, if you were going to write uh, to your son the 10 things he should know about hunting, what would they be today? They'll probably change, but what would they be today? Ten things. Uh, wow, that's a lot. That's a long list. But I would say uh, <laughs> number well, one go is with patience. Five. Go with five. <laughs> uh, number one is patience, and uh, patience 
to me. I mean, it's something that evolves as with somebody every single year. Um, when I first started hunting, I thought patience was just meant sitting long enough on the in their stand. And uh, it, it's come to realization over years that that's not what patience means. Patience can mean, you know, you have to be patient on when you go into the woods, how you go into the woods, what deer you're going to go for, what when you check your cameras. I mean, every aspect of hunting, you have to make sure you're hitting that right time to minimize your impact. And that just that evolves as you go. So patience is number one that he needs to learn. Uh, number two is the respect for the animal. Uh, you need ethical shots. Uh, make sure you're doing the best you can to give that animal's life the respect it deserves. Uh, number three, obviously, to consume every bit of that animal you can and to do it yourself. You don't have to take it to a processor. Everything that they can do, you can do with your knife in your house with that thing hanging up in the garage. Uh, was that three of them? Yep. Mm. <laughs> uh, I guess number four would just be, uh, you know, to, 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 sh to share those memories with, uh, with, with your loved ones and to share the food with your family and, uh, and take it for, for what it is. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be hard. You're not supposed to go out there and, and get one every day. You're not, it's not supposed to be easy. I mean, you're doing this because you're going to grow as a person each time in the woods. And that's, that's how you have to look at it. You can't look at it as, as you can't look at the success of your season being what you hung on the wall or what you put in your freezer, but what you've banked for next season. That's interesting. I, I like how you said that. The only thing I'd add to those um, is practice and we all have to practice, you know, practice walking, you know, practice, as you said, you know, hanging on and you hang on the same day you're going to hunt it, you know, uh, and, and, and practice, you know, shooting your weapon of choice and all those things. So when the moment comes, you don't have to think it's just all muscle memory, eye hand coordination, and you do what you need to do and you get the job done. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very important one to add to it. I'll go ahead and move that one up to number one. <laughs> yeah, it, because. I can remember so many times, you know, I've goosed myself up and go, oh, man, come on, son. Can I get in the game? Because my head was someplace else. <laughs> yeah, that can uh, that can for sure happen. And, and, you know, going back, just like the whole patience, uh, the patience aspect evolves. Uh, so does the whole idea of practice. You know, I mean, when you're starting out, like, you know, I thought my practice well was doing was enough practice. But then you realize, wait a minute, I'm I'm not nearly what these guys say I should be at, so I need to be practicing. I mean, that whole aspect of, of your practicing routine evolves as, as, like you said, as you get older too, as you get more seasons into it. One thing um, that I'd like to, you know, um, bring to the whole, um, you know, interview here to a close, you know, we're almost to 40 minutes. It's unbelievable how fast these things go, but um, so I'm telling you, I do them. A, I do them a, an hour and a half, an hour, forty five minutes. Sometimes it's like, holy crap! I wonder if anybody's going to listen to this. <laughs> yeah, but let's talk about patience in year one and patience in year five. Well, uh, patience in year one was essentially I had the same idea of patience in hunting as like I did with patience in fishing. You know, patience in fishing, it's essentially you're taught just you know keep your bait in the water and you're going to catch a fish. You know, that's, that's what patience is in fishing. So, so I, that's the mentality I went into it with hunting at first is, Hey, if I sit here long enough and show my devotion and patience, I'm going to see a deer eventually. And, uh, so that's what patience meant year one, but, uh, patience right now, it, I mean, it goes down to from everything from like going back to these properties that I've picked up this season, uh, of the three properties that I picked up on, one of them really held a decent amount of deer or uh, deer that I wanted to target. So with being the I, years past, I would have foolishly went in a month before the season and been in there every few days, checking cameras, uh, been scouting a bunch. And uh, this year I was a lot more reserved, a lot more patient in my approach when it going in, when it was raining to put up cameras at first and uh, checking them when it rained to keep my scent off and spending as little bit of time as I could in the woods. And as far as just my hunting approach this season, it's been, I've been hunting um, field edges of these woods. I know I have some bedding areas in these woods and I've been staying out of the beds and just been 
hitting field edges where I know I can get in without being spotted, have a good win, and get out without being spotted, and just try to catch something moving through there at the wrong time uh, and not really going in after him yet. You know, I don't want to dr- – not driving any bucks off the property, uh, and waiting for that those opportune times in November – and and getting a little bit deeper into those woods then so i mean from that aspect is i would have messed up this this spot that i have terribly if i would have got on, got it three years ago there probably wouldn't be deer left on the property and uh i i don't i i've gotten daylight pictures i'm not changing their patterns much it's just a matter of of catching one of these bucks at the right time when i have the advantage in the wind interesting and i like you know how you said um it, it, in your property, you're, you're hunting the fringes and, you know, the fringes work because deer are fringe critters that that's, that's where they, they basically live. And then, you know, pinch points and funnels and topography and all those things go into your bank. And then, you know, you'll start seeing places when you're walking, um, uh, land and stuff, you go, Oh, okay. If I was a buck here, I'd go this way. And you look at your wind and all of a sudden it starts making sense. I guess that's what I'm trying to share with you. Mm-hmm. it really will start making sense and, and it'll open it up like a like a book because you go okay i can read this but that takes that takes time and and a lot of student you know study and getting around guys like you have around you and they can say well have you thought about this and if you're going to hunt here you know uh the wind's going to bounce it's going to actually come off that valley and hit that ridge and it's going to bounce and and when you think it's going one way it's not I mean, all those are little things that make a difference of, you know, shoot, shooting, a, you know, the buck you want or you, or the doe you want because they're smart critters. Well, yeah, I mean, that's like, I mean, like you said about bouncing all ideas off other guys in the community I have. It's like I posted that uh, I showed the guys on the show the, some aerial shots, you know, like we always share in topography and stuff like that and kind of give each other pointers. And, and they were able to pick up on a funnel that was uh, a couple properties off my property, but that was definitely affecting my property that uh i could take advantage of setting up on some corner of the uh, this one corner of the property and uh i would have never have, have found that if it wasn't for these guys granted i haven't hunted that area yet because i I'm, I'm guessing they're bedded close there so i'm like i said that's one of those i'm i'm waiting to go in and hunt that area until they're they're in rut and they're not they're not worried about <laughs> their nose and thinking about something thinking with something else at the time <laughs> but um you know google earth uh, if, if you're not using Google Earth, I, I'm going to leave for Wisconsin on the 28th. And, you know, um, I thought I had a couple of farms in Buffalo County to hunt that didn't turn out. So, you know, all of a sudden I get with the biologists at DNR and I said, what about this place? What about that place? Bill Winky had hunted the property um, that I'm going to go to four years ago. And he wrote an article on it. I emailed him and he was gracious enough to get back to me, blah, 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 blah. But it's unbelievable what you can do with Google Earth because I get a lot of, you know, information and then I get on the ground and I could say, hmm, and, you know, here's, here's a pinch point, here's a long neck, here's, here's the, the general trend in the wind. And all of a sudden it makes sense, just like your guy oh, yeah. said. It, it just makes sense. And I'm, you know, I'm like a gazillion other guys that have just made so many mistakes <laughs> that, you know, hopefully learn some and, and then you start picking up on the nuances of, of terrain and just little saddles. I love hunting saddles. I just, you know, I live out West and I hunt saddles all the time. And, and the same thing holds true on the ridges because uh, critters are lazy. They really are. Yeah. They're going to take the, the path of least, least resistance always, you know, I mean, if they can, if, if there's a spot on a fence that's six inches lower than the rest of the fence, most likely they're going to cross at that spot on the fence. Yep. And it's just like going through swamps and crossing rivers and, you know, getting from the barrier, the feeding area, you know, they're going to go as direct as they can, but they're going to make it as easy on themselves. And sometimes people forget that, I think. <laughs> so you said you're going up to Wisconsin the uh, 28th? Yep. I'm going to, I leave here in Colorado the 28th and then I stay and um um, hunting uh, some farms and I've got some meetups with some of my listeners uh, throughout the state. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great, you know, 20 some days. Oh, you're with her for 20 days. I'm going to be actually in Wisconsin the uh, first through the sixth on my very first out of state hunt. So <laughs> where are you going? 
Uh, I'm going to uh, Ellsworth. It's uh, West Wisconsin, uh, kind of around the border of Minnesota. Yeah, it's, it's near the Chippewa, actually, Chippewa River. Yeah. And um, let's see, it's is that Pepin County or uh, Dunn County? Man, you're asking the wrong person. I don't know nothing about Wisconsin. I I, I got the address. I know the city, and I know I know what I got to bring. <laughs> I'm just getting the car, set my GPS, and driving. So, are you going by yourself? I I'm driving by myself. I'm meeting up with my uh, buddy from the show, Jake Franklin, the uh, one of my co-hosts on the show. So uh, it's gonna be our first time meeting, and we're gonna do like a little deer camp scenario up there for about five or six days. Gonna do a few podcasts during the day, hunt mornings and evenings, and hopefully put some some meat on the ground and. Have a great time. I'm pretty excited. I've never done a deer camp, never been out of state to hunt, never been on a trip to hunt. So I am I couldn't be even more excited. So yeah, the the seventh is supposed to be the, up in Wisconsin. It's supposed to be the hot day. I I like to hunt the thirtieth, thirty first, and then the first. I'd love to be in my stand on uh, Halloween. You know, I just I love that. Mm-hmm. Love that to death. It, it's just so much fun to do that. And um yeah, uh, Ellsworth. I'm just thinking it's south of I-90 or I-94. I'm just thinking where the heck it is. Anyway, that's going to be fun. You're going to see some, probably a lot of deer. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping to hit the, the to get close to their magic time in their rut and then get back home in time to for when our rut kind of picks up. So hopefully I'll be able to back-to-back some peak rut activity between the two states. But you know how that works out. <laughs> yep. But that's like what, 10, 12 hour drive for you? It's a ten and a half hour drive, yeah. Yeah. But it's e- easy roads. And just watch out for deer if you're driving late or early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm just I'm just glad it doesn't look like I'm gonna run into any snow on the drive. So fingers crossed, but it's looking good so far. <laughs> oh yeah, it will be. Well, folks, um it's just been really nice to hang out with Jason and, and talk about I hunt podcasts and you know I just love it when a guy says, you know, I'm going to start hunting and, and, you know, taking care of his own meat, feeding his family, uh, passing on the tradition and uh, sharing with others, just like we're doing right now, um, you know, tips and techniques and, and strategies. But uh, as I call it, common ground, sitting around the campfire and talking about hunting whitetails. So, Jason, it's just been a joy to have you on the show today. Mm-hmm. Hey, I appreciate you having me. Like I said, it's an honor. Uh, I would love to have you on sometime and chat with uh, me and the guys. And 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 you guys can check out the podcast. It's www.theihuntpodcast.com on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at the I Hunt Podcast. And uh, and don't and, and like I said, I'm not the uh, if it doesn't like I know what I'm talking about. I'm not the the pool of information that this show gets this information from. I'm just the guy that asks the questions because I'm the guy who needs to learn. And hopefully, you listeners learn along, pick something up along the way. So it's I Hunt Podcast with Jason Hamlet. Check him out. Just Google him and, and he'll show up. And and um, I'm sure you're going to be not only entertained, but you might learn something along the way. So with that, Jason, thank you on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America for being a, just a great guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thanks. Coming up next is Chris Enyard. Chris and his sons uh, and his daughters love hunting Iowa. Uh, Chris has done a lot of things in the chemical engineering uh, safety realm and has taken to various states. But lo and behold, he's home in Iowa now and couldn't be happier. They own 120 acres, which he's going to talk about how they're developing it and how they're helping deer grow and and trying to establish a balanced herd. Having said all that, um, Extreme Element Outdoors, was Emmett's brainchild. Now the whole family is part of this uh, program. You can see him on YouTube. Uh, check him out on uh, Facebook. All in all, it's one heck of a hunting family, and you're going to enjoy Chris's stories. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.